Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. So I'm very pleased uh, to welcome Vikram Adve to uh, Microsoft Research today. Uh, Vikram is an associate professor at the University of Illinois. Um, he's been doing a variety of work in the area of language implementation as well as uh, computer architecture and security. Uh, and recently he's been looking at techniques for safely executing uh, C and other kinds of programs uh, uh, while still preserving the safety and variance uh, of those program, allowing people to program using these kinds of languages and still preserving the safety and variance. So with that, I'll turn it over to Vikram. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you all for coming. I'm happy to be here. It's been, I think, four or five, I'm sorry, it's been almost six years since I last came to Microsoft Research and gave a talk. But uh, it's been a great day. I've met a lot of interesting people. Um, I'm going to tell you about a project that we have been working on in my group that I see um, as potentially becoming a fairly broad area of research for us. And we call it Secure Virtual Architecture. And I'll tell you more about it as we go along. This is joint work with a research programmer in my group, John Criswell, uh, who really has led the OS side of the work. And uh, graduate students, Dinakar, Sumanth, Andrew, and Balpreet. And there have been other people who have either developed techniques that we have built on in previous research. So Chris Latner built the LLVM compiler infrastructure and an underlying point analysis and program transformation that we use in this work. Um, a couple of people have, have worked with us on the interface between the uh, a kernel and our virtual architecture, Pierre Salverda and David Ryla. And we've had input and feedback from other faculty at Illinois, Sam King and Roy Campbell. Um, so the broad context for this work is that the threats to system software, to operating systems, and all of the privileged processes that run on top of an operating system, or in fact include um, applications that need to preserve security, are increasing even though security procedures are getting better. People are, uh, patches are being released and installed increasingly more effectively, tools are getting better to detect problems, but the problem is that the financial in incentives to attack systems, to exploit them, to extract data, and many other things are increasing very strongly. And this is a p potentially a huge new threat that could happen to computer systems. That are, You're seeing examples of this already, but it, it could grow uh, even further. <coughs> and one important consideration that you have to take into account when you're talking about security for systems today or for the foreseeable future is that the vast majority of them are written in C++, C or C++, so unsafe languages. And this is not only true of long-term systems. This is even true of new, completely re, uh, uh, newly developed highly secure systems like Secure64, which is a startup building highly secure operating systems for things like DNS servers and others. Um, it's obviously true for commodity operating systems like Windows, Linux, Mac OS, and BSD family. Um, it's also true for the services that run on many commodity systems today. <coughs> and of course, for servers like Apache and Find Other Names, which is a new server. <laughs> I'm sorry, I, ch I changed that last night, and of course, I didn't fix that <laughs> bullet there. Um, and one important issue that, that uh, to keep in mind is that the techniques that are being introduced in production systems to deal with, with security problems in these kinds of uh, systems are ad hoc partial solutions that, that uh, so things like marking stack or data not executable or software fault injection that tries to apply um, um, sandboxing on uh, software, things like that. And these are very limited partial solutions. They don't come close to eliminating the kinds of security holes that, you, that can exist in systems today. So one vision that's been held for for quite a long time is the 
the vision of running an, a complete operating system and system services in a safe execution environment because safe execution environments eliminate a large class of security holes, things like buffer overflows, dangling pointers, and others. They also improve system reliability because you eliminate those programming errors. And in some ways, perhaps most important, running an OS and system software in, in a safe programming environment gives you the ability to you to incorporate novel OS design techniques, things that would be difficult without that safe programming environment. And so research projects have developed many such techniques. Um, I've listed a bunch of examples here, but a couple of examples that I will pick on are, one is running entire user processes in the kernel address space, like software isolated processes in Singularity, or um, allowing um, so a second example is providing first class support for high level language virtual machines in the operating system itself because the managed runtime features that you need are integrated into the underlying system framework. There have been several projects that have taken the stack that have tried to explore this vision, but and but to date all of the ones that I know of, and I believe all of them, rely on a safe programming language. So the early systems like Genera and others built operating systems for Lisp machines and they wrote the systems in Lisp. Spin used Modular 3. Uh, there have been operating systems written in Java, Singularity is written using C Sharp. In all these cases, the research projects led to many novel OS design techniques and that's valuable research, but it's difficult to transition those ideas into commodity kernels that are widely used today because those kernels are not written and do not run in a safe execution environment. So what we have been trying to do is to develop a virtual architecture, a virtual machine and an interface to the virtual machine that allows you to run a complete OS and all of its software as well as any subset of applications that you choose, potentially all of them, on top of a on top of the virtual machine. And all of the code that runs on the virtual machine is compiled to a virtual instruction set, and that virtual instruction set is then translated to the native instruction set of the underlying processor transparently, typically offline. We, we, there is no specific reason to have to do this online, although you could if you chose. <clears throat> and just to break down that box a little, um, the definition of this virtual architecture includes an API that provides access to hardware resources, um, including process state control operations um, and hardware control operations that a kernel typically needs to manage hardware resources. And underlying that is the implementation, which we call an execution engine, that includes the capabilities like code generation, um, safety checking, and potentially techniques to optimize and profile code that is running on top of this virtual machine. And this execution engine uses a simple API that's OS independent and, and would have to be implemented by any particular OS portal to it to cache um, data offline. That can include native translation of code that's generated from the virtual object code. It can include profile data if that's useful for profile driven execution. Um, but that's an optional capability. The caching is not strictly required for uh, the system. So that's the goal of the work, is to, is to be able to run legacy kernels like Linux and others by porting them to this virtual instruction set and this API. <clears throat> and what's important about this is I think there are, there are a wide range of interesting benefits of, doing, of, of running a system like this. I've broken them into two categories, and then there's a third category of things that we cannot deal with. But I'm focusing here on security problems just because that's one important area where I think a virtual machine like this could have significant impact. The first class of problems are problems that you would expect to be solved by using a safe language or a safe execution environment. And these are well-known things like buffer overflows and format string errors and other ones like that. Right? 
there's also a second category of 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 systems of of problems where um, the compiler based virtual machine underlying the system could enable new solutions these are not new problems but the solutions you could take to address them can be new and these include things like applications uh, running with excessive privilege and programs trying to protect application data from from being visible to the underlying operating system detecting kernel mode rootkits securely in a way that cannot be tampered with even by injected code that got kernel access and many others so there are a number of high level security problems that i think could be addressed by this kind of framework there are also problems that would not be that may not be significantly helped by, by this kind of framework you would probably need extensive application level solutions for them and they're not really goals of our work but those first two categories i think are things that um we could start exploring using this kind of framework in this talk i'm give me one second i'll come back to you in this talk i'm primarily going to focus on the design of the virtual architecture the underlying virtual machine and how we achieve this achieve a safe execution environment i am uh, i'll briefly touch on higher level security problems and a couple of higher level security problems that we can address and discuss them towards the end of the talk but this is in my mind of uh, an area that's wide open for research it seems on the first look to be uh, very much like a redo of the v old vm 370 with a change of um, virtual machine language uh, so is is it uh, so ibm i think you're right in the sense that ibm was the first to really develop a whole framework that allowed so they had this language called the machine interface that actually started in the early IBM um I forgot the name, the first machine that had it but um it was later called new machine language they allow so they have a whole layer of translation from the machine from the machine interface down to native hardware one of the big differences i think so if i go back to the picture here one of the big differences is that their virtual machine their compiler framework for doing the translation and a lot of the other runtime support was actually tightly integrated into the operating system itself so they had um so an operating system had a bunch of code that ran above the interface and a lot of code that ran below the interface even database so they had strong support for database execution in the virtual machine itself fundamentally their virtual instruction set was co-designed with the operating system and even with important classes of applications like database systems um it would be very difficult to try and host one of those environments on top of a processor today what we are trying to do here is define something that's much smaller and more compact and um is designed to run on today's um processors and run today's software So what I'm going to do in this talk is spend a few slides giving you a high level overview of what SVA is and how it operates then describe the virtual instruction set and the compiler framework we use uh, in the virtual machine then discuss the safety guarantees that we provide and how we achieve them and then briefly talk about other future security applications of the framework So this is a picture of how you would port an existing system to the virtual machine to the secure virtual architecture and this is how we've ported a version of the linux kernel 2.24.20 2.4.22 um <clears throat> in our group so you essentially what what you have to do is take the existing operating system and port the kernel to the api for privileged operations that we have defined and at the end of that port you would have a kernel with no assembly code in it you would have no native code native machine code that's directly part of the kernel itself all hardware level resources are accessed through this api and a second thing you have to do is port kernel allocators to a checker interface that we define that allows us to perform the safety the runtime safety checks that we need to enforce memory safety and the other safety guarantees and you would then put that compiler through is i mean put that system through a safety checking 
compiler. That safety checking compiler does a collection of static checks and then inserts, so, and then generates a, the operating system in SVA in the virtual instruction set. We call that bytecode. Um, this bytecode for the operating system includes type annotations that describe the safety properties that the OS is intended to satisfy. So the compiler generates those safety um, uh, annotations, which are essentially a type system. Yeah? So how much labor is involved in this supporting? This porting, that depends heavily on the operating system and how uh, well its portability interface is defined. I would think that for Linux, so we ported Linux incrementally as we were defining this, designing this API itself. So the, so the time that we took is, is not representative of anything. Um, starting from scratch with this API, I would think a person could do it in a matter of perhaps two to three months, one person in two to three months. I think that would be feasible. You might not get a complete port in that much time, but you'd get a sufficient port that you could run it on the system. And one thing I should say is that in our port, we have not ported the bootloader over. So the bootloader still runs as native code. There's no technical reason why we could not do that. It's just not something that was necessary for any of the research that we are doing. Yeah. So couldn't you have some automated tools which would capture the calls from the kernel and then try to map it? You could try to do that. It's You would need to have a very detailed and accurate description of the semantics between the architecture independent part of the kernel and the architecture dependent part. So you, so a, you know, a clean interface is not enough. You'd need a lot of description of the semantics of that interface to do the porting. You could, you could certainly develop tools that would simplify the porting, but it's not something that um, we've thought about. And, and personally, I'm not sure that's actually uh, terribly important. If it was important, people ever d would have done it for operating systems already today. Because this porting effort is something that, that operating systems go through on a periodic basis. Any other questions? OK, so then running this operating system on the virtual architecture goes like this. So we take the OS that's been compiled to SVA bytecode, run it through what we call a verifier, which is in, in our case simply a, a, a type checker. And then, and this type checker also puts in runtime checks for the cases that cannot be um, uh, completely checked statically. And that code is then passed to a code generator, which generates native code. Links The native code is linked with the, a library implementing the privileged operations. You don't actually need to do this as a library. If you, if you prefer, you can, since, since the semantics of this library is well defined and known to the compiler, the compiler could actually incorporate operations from this library, optimize them for a particular architecture, and you may not necessarily need to provide them through a library. Uh, but conceptually, this is just an API implemented by a library. And then you would, you would boot that system, and that you could write the compiled and checked um, OS in native code out to disk at this point and read it back as long as you have some way of, of ensuring that, the, that that image is not corrupted. So you need to cryptographically sign it and check it when you read it back to make sure it's not been tampered with. And that's how we how we expect systems to run on this environment. Uh, one important point here is that these steps, which are all part of the trusted computing base for our system, are cons are technically significantly simpler than the safety ch safety checking compiler itself. That compiler does fairly sophisticated interprocedural analysis and transformations to achieve the safety. Uh, guarantees that we provide with low overhead and so on. And our system is designed deliberately to take that safety checking compiler out of the trusted computing base and only having a simple bytecode verifier, a simple type checker, in fact, in here. A, a second benefit besides eliminating the, the, besides reducing the trusted code base is that these two operations are not interprocedural. They are purely, they are they operate per function. In fact, the type checker is purely local. And so these can be done incrementally on modules or components that are dynamically loaded into the kernel. 
the checking can be done incrementally at install time or load time. But that allows, as an engineering issue, this, that's extremely important for real-world systems. <coughs> so I'll just take you through some of the key design features that we have att attempted to have in SVA. Number one, we want the system to the the security guarantees, the safety checking techniques to be comprehensive. We, we want to apply them to all security sensitive software on the system, including the kernel, OS extensions, device drivers, all of the daemons, you know, important libraries like SSL, potentially all of the applications. It, it, what applications are uh, included in that set are up to a system administrator um, who can choose, if, if necessary, to run all applications through this environment. <clears throat> Second, we want the security checking to be incontrovertible. By that, I mean that it cannot be bypassed by any software that runs on this system. So, and, and the way you achieve this is by having the installer, which is logically part of the operating system, perform any safety checking operation that it wants to do using the virtual machine as essentially a library. So any safety checks that either the operating system or the virtual machine wants to enforce can be done and will be done at install time or load time. <coughs> Third, we wanted it to be ro robust. And, and by that, I simply mean making the trusted computing base as small as possible. We've, really only, we've taken one, one step in that direction by taking out the safety checking compiler. I think we could go further, for example, taking out the native code generator by using a typed assembly language um, for the machine code that is generated. Um, so this is an incremental process, but I think that's an important goal as well. Third, uh, fourth, and this is a property that, that the system has, even though we don't exploit it in any way right now. The, it's a whole system environment. What I mean by that is that compiler techniques, runtime monitoring, and so on can apply across traditional boundaries, like the boundary between an application and the kernel, or across multiple applications that might be interacting. By compiling everything down to this uniform virtual instruction set that's designed for good analysis and transformation, we can apply sophisticated compiler techniques across these boundaries. So for example, we've done a simple experiment where we extended a kernel with new system calls, with specialized versions of existing system calls, is the right, that's the right way to think about it, for a specific application. And effectively, that allowed us to exploit constant arguments that existed in that application. That's a very simple example, but it shows that you can, you can do these kinds of whole system transformations. And the last one is that the system, the design, can exploit hardware assists that are now starting to emerge as standards. So, you, so a trusted platform module gives you a way to do what's called secure boot. So you can securely, uh, you can boot a system and authenticate all of the software, what's called a chain of trust, that goes from, from um, step to step during that boot process and the later process of forking applications. You can also use uh, what's called an IOMMU, which is essentially uh, support, hardware support, to check DMA, to run DMA through, page, um, through the paging system so that you can apply operating system protections to DMA as well. And not many people realize this, but in fact today DMA is essentially um, unsafe. You can, DMA operations can override any part of memory, even on um, on a hypervisor-based system like VMware or Zen. Uh, <clears throat> so we've developed a prototype of this framework. It includes an implementation of the PrivOps API, a library that, that uh, is written in C and x86 assembly code, and it's compiled to, into a native library ahead of time and linked into a, a, a kernel. Um, we've implemented a set of safety a safety checking compiler that actually came out of an earlier project called Safe Code. The earlier project focused on standalone programs. We are now extending that to work on the kernel, and we provide the same safety guarantees for both standalone programs and the kernel. 
Um, and, and I said that we have an untrusted safety checking compiler. We've also ported a Linux kernel to this. It looks just like a port to a new architecture. It just happens to be a virtual architecture. And in fact, that makes it significantly simpler than, than porting to a typical hardware architecture like x86 or something else. Um, all, there is no assembly code left in this ported, in this ported kernel um, excepting the boot loader, which logically is not part of the kernel in any case. <clears throat> and we have, in doing this port, we treat specific allocators as, we treat the kernel's allocators as pre-existing pool allocators, and I'll, I'll talk about why that's important later on in the talk here. So that was an overview of the system. Let me talk about the virtual instruction set and the compiler system. The virtual instruction set has two parts to it. There's the unprivileged operations that are used for most of the core computations. Um, and those operations are derived directly from a compiler system called LLVM. In fact, it is simply the virtual, the bytecode representation and internal representation used by the LLVM infrastructure. I'll say a little bit more about that. I just have one slide on that. We have extended that representation with um, a type system to encode the safety properties that we are enforcing. And this is a, this same, this kind of extension can be done for other security annotations if there are other security properties that you want to enforce by, by doing an ahead of time uh, analysis and transformation and then doing a, a type checker, running a type checker at install time or load time. The privileged operations go through an API that manages all kernel hardware interactions. And the most important thing point about that API is that it only defines mechanisms that a kernel will need uh, to run on a particular piece of hardware. It does not dictate any policy. So all policy decisions are left entirely to the kernel itself. <coughs> the compiler foundation for the virtual machine comes from our previous project called LLVM. The, the original research goal of LLVM was to provide a foundation for what we call lifelong compilation, being able to do sophisticated compiler techniques at any stage of, of the lifetime of a program, and that goes from initial compile time through link time, install time, load time, run time, as well as what we call idle time, which is between executions on the end user's machine. And fundamentally, the way you achieve that is by using a persistent code representation that is designed for effective optimization. So what I mean by that is, I think a good way to think about this is contrast this with um, uh, Java, by, Java virtual machine bytecode. JVM bytecode is a relatively high level language. It is also persistent, and you can analyze and transform it at all points, at all the points in time that it's available. But there are many low level transformations you cannot perform on it because it does not expose lower level operations. Like for example, the, implement, the implementation of a virtual function call isn't exposed at the Java virtual machine level. All of those kinds of implementation details are exposed in this IR. Um, as it turns out, that research project has taken on a life of its own. It's now being used by quite a few companies. Um, some companies, including Apple and Adobe, are using it as a just-in-time compiler. There are other companies like Cray that are using it as a static backend to generate static, uh, to do static code generation. Um, both of these users also do mid-level optimization ahead of time. So in a sense, this lifelong compilation capability is, is being exploited to, in a limited way by these companies already. But the important thing about that is that it gives us a commercial quality um, infrastructure into which a lot of investment is going on. And, and the software is available at llvm.org. It's fully, uh, it's, it, we distribute it under a liberal open source license. All of the development that happens on it, at least at Apple, as well as all the other open source projects using it, are contributed back to the external, to our um, CVS server running at Illinois. So you can get, you can benefit from all the investments that are happening on it. And, and if you're interested to try it out, the software is available at llvm.org. Sorry, that was a quick commercial for LLVM. But getting back to the point here, so the virtual instruction set for um, um, our virtual machine 
include several features. I won't go through all of the detailed examples here. This is just a, uh, an example that shows a simple C uh, fragment of code that's compiled to the LLVM instruction set. The important features here are, first, the operations are low level. So it's a, it's a simple load store architecture with, with, a, with a set of virtual registers. That's an unlimited set of virtual registers. The virtual registers are in static single assignment form, and so we have explicit fee operations to represent the SSA form here. And that allows us, that gives us a basis to do data flow analysis on this code. It's a typed representation, and it essentially includes a subset of the types that the C programming language gives you. It includes structures, arrays, pointers, and functions, as well as the obvious primitive types. And that's a, essentially a kind of mid-level type info, and, but, but it's rich enough to be able to do sophisticated point analysis, dependence analysis, and program transformations directly on this representation. <coughs> the privileged operations, I'm actually not going to say a whole lot about them. I just have one slide here. They're in, you can divide them into two categories. There are hardware control operations, um, like operations to register system call handlers, interrupt handlers, trap handlers, and so on. Um, and that these registration operations allow us to monitor all, entry, all entries into the operating system. Similarly, there are operations to register page table entries that allow us to ma monitor all page mapping in events, and uh, similarly, firewall operations. The second category is state manipulation operations that allow the kernel to save and restore state during a context switch, for example. And one important feature there is that the kernel directly saves and restores native state, not virtual state. It essentially gets a bag of bytes that represent the native state of the underlying code in order to avoid overhead of translating back into virtual state at context switches. Um, and other operations like signal delivery, which also requires setting up some data and then doing a context switch. Um, an interrupt context that allows us to, to very efficiently field interrupts by exploiting hardware support for this. These are the kinds of operations that are provided in this API. <coughs> so that's all I have to say about the virtual instruction set. If there are any questions, I'd be happy to stop and take them. I have many more slides with with details, and one thing I should warn you is this is going to be a very high-level talk. So if people are interested in more details, I'd be happy to perhaps do it after the, for one round of questions or, or just towards the end of the talk if you're interested. So what I'm going to talk about next are the safety guarantees that we provide and the principles by which we achieve them. Um, the safety guarantees that we try to provide, and, and one thing to keep in mind here is we're trying to do this for unmodified C programs. For in, the, in the case of standalone programs. In the case of the kernel, the, um, the only modification we require is porting the um, kernel allocators to our checker interface in order to preserve the kernel allocators. So what we, tr what we provide are guarantees that are close to what a safe language to provide uh, provides, which is very strong for C, but it's still not quite equal to a safe language, and I'll come back to that. But that includes memory safety. So for example, you never use uninitialized pointers. You never have array overflows, so, so array bounds violations. Um, we guarantee type safety for a subset of the objects in a program, and I'll characterize that. I'll, I'll explain that in a little more detail later. We enforce control flow integrity. And specifically, what I mean by that is that the executing code will never take an execution path that was not predicted by the compiler. And we also guarantee a sound operational semantics for C code. This is something that not a lot of people think about in practice, but in fact, C compilers are essentially not sound because memory safety violations like a dangling point or a buffer overrun can invalidate the assumptions the compiler makes in doing basic analyses like point analysis, like other like data flow transformations and other things. And optimizing compilers essentially say that there are no guarantees if, the, if one of those memory safety violations occurs. That's not good enough for a safety checking compiler. And it's also not good, en not good enough for analysis tools like static checking tools that aim to give some kind of guarantee of a, that a particular property is satisfied by the code. 
So we are able to guarantee a sound operational semantics that allows you to do sound static analysis on C code despite the possibility of dangling pointer errors. So that, that brings me to the major weakness compared with a safe language and I should emphasize this weakness is by design, we do not eliminate dangling pointer errors. And we do that deliberately because we're trying to avoid the need to run a garbage collector in, uh, in these environments or, or for, any of this C, for any of the C software. And so, we, so dangling pointer errors can occur, but we do still guarantee that all of these properties are satisfied. And that's what I... So I, so, we, so I say you have to be tolerate dangling pointer errors. We guarantee that none of these properties will be invalidated by a potential dangling pointer error at runtime. And I think in many ways that's probably one of the main intellectual contributions of the safety part of this work is how to provide this kind of guarantee, which I don't think any previous compiler has provided. We can also optionally detect all dangling pointer users. Um, it's a technique that we've developed recently that has low overhead for programs that are not very allocation intensive. It can have fairly high overheads for allocation intensive programs, um, but still that overhead is in the order of 3x to 10x. It's reasonable for debugging. For example, it's significantly better than Valgrind or Purify or tools like that that, you, that, are, the, that are used today for dangling pointers. And the lo overhead is actually low enough that for some uh, programs like Unix daemons, we found it, it's, you can use it for production code. The slowdowns are in the range of 5 to 10 percent for many of those uh, kinds of demons. And overall, one, one of the main goals in developing our safety techniques is to keep them practical. The, for standalone programs, as I said before, it's completely automatic. It does not require you to write wrappers to interface with external libraries like other compilers do. So systems like Secure and, and SafeC and Cyclone, because they use fat pointers, cannot interface automatically with external code always. They require you to write some wrappers to do that, and we've avoided that. Or those systems also use garbage collection, at least Secure and Cyclone do. Um, or in, in the case of Cyclone, they use uh, a combination of garbage collection and region-based memory management. We have tried to avoid the need for any kind of automatic memory management because C programs are really not written to make that very effective. And we have a result show we have very low overhead for C programs, and I'll describe these a little bit later. So I'm just going to take you through some of the underlying principles that we use to achieve these safety guarantees. Um, I think you know, ex ex describing these <coughs> in more detail I could do with an additional 10 or 20 minutes, and I'd be happy to do that. I have all the slides that we need for that. But if you have any questions, just let me know, and if you like, I can go through it in more detail later. The first idea underlying our safety techniques is that um, we partition memory, so we perform a program transformation called automatic pool allocation that was in PLDI a couple of years ago that transforms a program so that the memory used by the program is logically partitioned into pools and those partitions correspond to the, the static partitions computed by a pointer analysis. So if you think of a pointer analysis, so, so think of a points to graph computed by a pointer analysis for example. Typically, the nodes in that graph represent disjoint sets of memory objects. And the, the, the graph then is basically a static partitioning of the objects created and accessed by the program. And these pools at runtime, the runtime pools correspond directly to the compile time partitions created by the pointer analysis. And that gives us a, a couple of important benefits. So first, we can enforce sound pointer analysis by performing what I call pool checks on load and store operations. And those pool checks are much more efficient than if you didn't do this pool allocation transformation. Because in the original program, the, the memory, the objects in a particular points to set might be scattered around in the, he, in the heap and stack and globals. And checking that a pointer points to the correct set, intended set of objects would be extremely expensive. Because 
we have a, we can we know the logical pool that a pointer variable is supposed to point to and those pools are managed by our runtime we simply have to check a set of contiguous pages um, for each such pool check this also allows us to enforce partial type safety so that i mentioned this point earlier a points to graph during the analysis um, can you can infer type information for some of the nodes in a points to graph essentially because the pointer analysis is is examining all the operations that potentially occur on a on the points to nodes except for nodes that are access accessible by external code so for some subset of nodes we're examining all the operations and we know which that subset is and we can check whether all those operations obey a certain data type and if they do then we mark that points to set as a as a as a set that's type homogeneous whose type is known at compile time and for that for any objects that map to those sets we uh, guarantee type safety in the system the second idea here is to exploit these type homogeneous pools as for performance optimization so we can eliminate all runtime checks on loads and stores to these type homogeneous pools because essentially at compile time we have examined all the operations on those pools so essentially we've done a static check to guarantee that those operations are type safe the only exception here then is array bounds checking so the type checker cannot guarantee that you that you don't violate the uh, the bounds of an array in one of these pools and so you need runtime checks for that but we get rid of all of the checks and loads and stores to these pools a second important benefit here is that dangling pointers become harmless for a pool that's type homogeneous as long as you add one important constraint at runtime which is that you align all objects on identical boundaries so essentially what happens is an old object and a new object in the same logical pool will either overlap perfectly or not at all and when i say overlap perfectly i mean all of their fields so the component values will align correctly and so a dangling pointer so that was that intended to access the old object but happens to access a new one will never create any type conversions any unintended type conversions in the code and so the dangling so dangling pointers become harmless essentially for free for these type homogeneous pools for non type homogeneous pools we have to do the runtime checks on loads and stores to ensure that they have uh, that they target the right pool and runtime checks on array bounds operations to make sure that you don't violate array bounds um the third insight that we've had here is that we can perform array bounds checking very effectively without adding metadata on pointers and this is um an issue that takes a couple of sort of uh, steps to explain but the the problem here is we want to ensure that array indexing operations are safe in c and in c a pointer may point to an arbitrary location in the middle of an array so taking a pointer value at runtime you do not know where the start or end of the object is so there's no easy way like in java to go to the header and find the expected bounds the intended bounds of that pointer and this is sometimes called identifying the referent object for a pointer that's the difficult part of of this in c question do you have c code on casting if you have a pointer to cast yeah i get the wrong word to some other type um are you talking about this bounds checking or are you talking about the whole the in overall general, approach in general pointer to object yeah. a and then cast to something yeah. completely different how yeah. do you reinterpret it reinterpret the memory right so essentially what we do there is so first one thing to realize is that in those cases those objects will fall in pools that are not type homogeneous because you will if you performed operations using both those types right if you simply cast something to void star and back or even cast to char star and back or something like that and don't do any any operations using the char star we just ignore that but if you do any actual operations like array indexing structure indexing or a load or store using a pointer type then using both types then the pool will not be type homogeneous so we don't guarantee any type safety for those objects and presumably the programmer intent deliberately wrote that cast 
and we're not, you know, we're essentially preserving the semantics of the program, and we're giving a, a, a guarantee that is weaker than what safe languages would give you, but safe languages would simply disallow these kinds of costs, right? Any other questions? So, array bounds checks, how do you do with inline arrays? With inline arrays? An object that contains an inline array, so... Oh, an array inside a structure. Yep. Yeah, so, so let me explain how we do it for any array, and it includes inline arrays. There's no difference. But the, the, so, so coming back to the problem, I was saying that in array bounds checking for C, the problem is finding the intended target object of a pointer. One way to do this is to, is to add metadata to every pointer variable, every point of value at runtime that tracks the intended bounds. And this is what pre several previous systems do. This is what Secure does, Cyclone, SafeC, all of them use metadata on point of values. And the problem is that changes the, the logical pointer representation and now you cannot interface this code directly with external libraries without, at least in some cases, having to write wrappers manually. Um, an alternative way, which was originally proposed by Jones and Kelly, is to not add any metadata to pointers, but maintain a lookup table of all the objects that are created by a program during execution, and maintain the invariant that a pointer always points within the bounds of its object. So you, so you initialize a pointer to point to a certain object, and from that point on, in all pointer arithmetic operations, you ensure it stays within the bounds of its expected object. And if you think about that for a minute, you, you, you realize the overhead of that is extremely high. And their overheads ranged, so that, the overhead of that technique ranged from 4x to 11x slowdowns to get these kinds of, uh, to get, to do bounce checking. Um, obviously, it's going to be a little hard to convince people to use that kind of technique. But one uh, insight that we had is that we could bring the, bring the overheads down greatly if instead of using one large lookup table for all the allocated objects in the program, we could use several small tables. And fundamentally, that original pool allocation transformation gives you exactly that. It gives you logical pools that partition memory into smaller sets. So we maintain one lookup, one lookup table per pool. And the important thing here is, that we know at compile time for every pointer variable which pool to check, because that's something that we've enforced during the pool allocation transformation. And so we know which table to check. We can do a lookup in that table. And that greatly reduces the overhead. Um, in fact, we also did a couple of other optimizations along with that, which could have been done in previous work too, but just wasn't. And together, we bring down the overheads to the range of 10 to 20 percent for most programs, we've had a worst case uh, instance of, uh, the worst case we've seen so far is like 69 percent overhead for one program. That's quite array intensive. Um, but the, you get a dramatic reduction in overhead, and we're avoiding metadata on pointers. Yeah. So is it possible in the program that the uh, pointer could reference to objects from multiple tools? Static, For multiple pools? No, but no, pointer. no. Because so have different types. So, so this transformation if called automatic pool allocation, that works with a unification-based point analysis. So we have a at compile time we have an invariant that the every pointer points to only a single node in the points to graph, a single points to set essentially, and that's a constraint on the kinds of techniques that we can inf for, for which we can guarantee soundness. But if, it's a, if, a, if a pointer could point to data in multiple data structures, yeah. and if you compile a cannot in multiple apart, would you put um, data from both structures in the same pool? Yes, that's there? exactly what it would be. So all the objects that are potentially pointed to by a common pointer will en end up in a single pool. Yeah? Uh, is the programmer responsible for somehow rewriting the program so it doesn't keep offsets that are outside of objects? So you mean for this, for the bounce checking work here? That's a good question. Yeah. So the question here was, um, is the programmer responsible for rewriting programs if a program does indexing that goes out of the bounds of an object and potentially comes back in bounds before being used? So in other words, it's not an illegal operation because the pointer is not used while it's out of bounds. Is that right? 
And uh, the program was not responsible for that. Um, in fact, a large part of the overheads in previous work was exactly for that. There was an extension to the Jones and Kelly work by, by Ruasi and Lam, who showed how to do that safely. And what they do is they use a separate lookup table for these what, what, what we call out-of-bounds pointers. And that was one of the optimizations that, that we have done that made it much more effective. Essentially, what we do is when a pointer goes out of bounds, we replace that pointer value by an illegal address that would cause a sec fault if you actually used it, but then maintain a lookup table from the address of that pointer to the bounds of the original object. So now if the pointer comes back into bounds, we can replace it back again with the original point, with the original um, um, we can repeat the original metadata. Any other questions here? <clears throat> so I'm just going to talk about, uh, so give you a quick summary of the experiments we've done to measure the runtime overheads of this framework. We've, uh, these numbers include two benchmark suites, Olden and Pointer Dist, which are both uh, pointer intensive uh, sets of programs. And we've also looked at a collection of system demons. Um, the full list is in this paper cited here. We did not require any source code changes for any of these programs. This was fu fully automatic. And the array bounds checking technique was able to detect all attacks from a suite that was developed by someone called Zitzer that models a number of reported exploits that have, been, uh, that have occurred on, on system software. Um, so the table here lists a subset of the programs. The rest are in the paper. These include the worst cases um, for, for all these suites. And the overheads without the array bounds check. So as it turns out, um, we can guarantee sound analysis without doing precise array bounds checks. The sound analysis only requires that we guarantee that pool bounds are satisfied. So we can ensure ensure the point analysis is sound simply by checking pool bounds and not individual array bounds. Um, if you want finer grain memory safety, then you can turn on the array checks. Without the array checks, the worst case overheads we've seen are 30% for Yakko 2, 23% for Anagram. Most of the other cases, I'm sorry, 27% for EM3D. Most of the other cases are 0, 3, 7%. Yeah. If you turn on the array checks, then some of the overheads get much worse. So for example, EM3D goes from 27% to 91%. Um, and that's, there's one bad array reference that's in an innermost loop. And we were only able to pull out the bounds check, I think, out of one level of loop or something like that. And so you get potentially very significant overhead if you're running for example, a scientific program, which this is, with a lot of array operations. So, so this is using the LLVM system as the baseline? This is comparing against, yes, it's using, it's using LLVM as the baseline without the pool allocation transformation and none of the safety checking passes. The safety checking compiler, by the way, is, is called SafeCode. I didn't introduce that name before. But. So how is it that you got um, better performance sometimes with the yeah, that's a good question. So, um, uh, so the this was an x86. Yeah. <laughs> so many, I many variations you can see. It. Yeah. So, and there are differences in code layout when you turn on the array checks versus when you do not, and that's the only explanation I have right now for why the performance changed there. Any other, any other question? Can you, can you tell me like, how big, some, big these programs are? Yeah, these are not very big programs. So these programs are in the range of, so the, so the olden programs are in the range of a few hundred to um, an order of about a thousand lines of code. The pointer disk programs go up to, um, I think, 10,000 lines of code. That's the largest one is about that big. The demons, I think GHTTPD is in the order of a cup. Uh, it's on order of thousands of lines of code. Um, <coughs> any other questions here? Oops. So just a quick comparison. We compared this with Secured on 
the older and pointed as benchmarks. And if you look at the secured numbers, it has much higher time overheads except on EM3D where it benefits because it has the fat pointer representation. So it doesn't have to do the lookups for, for, um, for object tables. It has much higher space overheads because they're using a conservative garbage collector and they've reported space overheads of up to 4x for some of their programs. And they described in detail some of the porting effort that's required. If you look at their Toplas paper, um, that was needed to run the olden and pointer disk benchmarks on secured. So how did you, uh, it's not clearly exactly what you were comparing there compared to secured. What was the baseline for that comparison? Their comparison was, so what I'm comparing there are the reported percentage slowdowns with secured versus without secured using a common, a common backend compiler, and I don't remember what backend compiler they used. So I'm comparing their percentages versus our percentages, okay. which are not on common baselines, yeah. and I understand that. Um, so you have to take this with a grain of salt, but I think that if you look at the, the whole set of numbers and look at the pattern, there is a clear pattern in the differences between the numbers. In both cases, the experiments isolate the slowdowns Due to the due to the safety checking techniques, so I think it's actually a, a reasonable comparison. <clears throat> Any other questions? So these techniques that we originally developed in the Safe Code project for standalone programs uh, need significant extensions to work on a kernel, uh, and I'll talk a little bit about that here. Perhaps most importantly, kernel use, kernels use many custom allocators. They're all pool allocators of one sort or another, but the important point is that they, um, that these allocators are required for correctness, not just for performance. They're preserving, the, they're enforcing properties like pinning pages in memory or alignment requirements and other things that would be difficult to reproduce in using an automatic transformation like pool allocation. So, so we did not want to try and run automatic pool allocation on the kernel code and include a new pool allocator above the kernel's memory management itself. So we basically retain all existing kernel allocators and um, we define a clean interface. So there are two things we have to do here. One, the easy part is we define a clean interface between the allocator and the checker, which does the runtime checks. So the allocator notifies the checker for the information needed, like objects that are allocated or deallocated, or pages of memory that are retrieved from the underlying system. The much more complicated and, and conceptually difficult part is what to do with this, the compiler's safety checking passes. So the, the trick that we are using here is essentially to infer a mapping from the kernel's allocators, the kernel's pools, not allocators, the kernel's pools, to the points to graph nodes that we derive in our point analysis. So we run a point analysis on the kernel, construct a points to graph. We have to be informed of the allocation function used in, or functions used in each of those allocators. We treat those as allocation entry points in order to match logical pools in the kernel to the points to graph nodes. And essentially then the rest of our safety checking techniques work as before. We maintain metadata for the pools at runtime. We, uh, one important thing we have to take into account is that sometimes you will get multiple kernel pools for a single node in the points to graph. That's a case where the point analysis was not precise enough to distinguish those pools. And so we actually create something we call meta pools to track sets of pools at runtime. There's one meta pool per points to graph node. And all the checking techniques I described earlier happens per meta pool. So that's one major extension that, that we've had to do. A second one is that kernels have many external entry points, many more than a standard program. That includes interrupts, traps, and system calls. And some of those entry points can bring in pointers to external objects into the kernel. For example, buffers that get passed in through a system call. And for points to graph, so the problem that, that the way the compiler sees this problem is you have a points to graph node that's accessible from external code, in fact, from a pointer that comes in through some external interface. 
And therefore, that the corresponding logical pool should include objects that were actually allocated externally, so for example, by user code, but which would not have been registered in the pool. And so we would get false positives at runtime. Essentially, we would declare safety error violations when, in fact, it's a perfectly safe operation. So in those cases, we have to turn off some runtime checks. We can still perform checks on all the array indexing operations because those checks look for an existing object and then decide if the pointer increment, the, the indexing operation, violated the bounds of the object. So if the object simply doesn't exist, we just ignore that. But if a, an object does exist, we can enforce the bounds for it. A third, so there are other minor issues. Um, well, the third one is a minor issue. The fourth one is not. But the third one is that early in the boot sequence, you don't even have memory available. You have no, none of the allocators might be available to use directly. And so, for example, we need to create, allocate memory or, or have access to memory to store metadata for objects. Essentially, we have to reserve some physical memory early in the boot process to deal with this issue. But it's an example of the kinds of things that are just different in a kernel from, user, from a, application code. And there's extensive use of non-type safe code in the, in the kernel. And so um, we're we are having to make both our static array bounds checking, which, by the way, was not included in those previous numbers. So all the previous numbers I showed you did not include any static array bounds checking at all. We are using static array bounds checking and, in fact, trying to make it more aggressive than what we had in the system earlier and do additional runtime tuning to try and handle the overheads introduced by these. So this is very much a work in progress at this point, and we have a working prototype, and we're working on both making it more robust and doing performance tuning, and, tr and also trying to decrease the number of uh, checks that we have to eliminate because of having external, externally accessible uh, uh, pools. Sorry. So the last slide I have here on the safety principles is on verifying the security of SVA bytecode. I don't have a lot more detail to add here, except that the type system that we use to encode the safety properties is a relatively simple region-based type system. It, we, derive, we, we got a number of uh, techniques directly from the Cyclone type system and use them here. Um, the types essentially include a stack of regions the regions essentially are the logical pools that we have inferred, and every object is registered in one of those regions. So it's registered in one of those pools. And we have a region annotation on the type for every pointer variable that encodes what region it's supposed to point to. And that type system then is checked by a simple local type checker, which also inserts runtime checks. These are the checks that I described earlier. So we, you're talking about stack of regions as in top and top pass? Work, yes, or, exactly. So you, you're actually able to reclaim pools? Yes. And the way you're able to do that is because we construct a points to graph, you can do reachability analysis on the points to graph. So you can evaluate, for example, at any point in the code, like a function return, is a pool, or, or a function entry for that matter, is a pool accessible from any pointers that are live outside that function? That includes global variables, incoming arguments, and the return value. And if the pool is reachable from any of those, then the, function, then the pool is still live on return from the function. If it's not reachable, then we can reclaim the pool completely. So you use reachability in terms of garbage collection reachability, as opposed to, for example, top down top hands like use. They, 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 had, they allowed gangling pointers to, Unused, uh, yes. to, to pools that were reclaimed as, as long as they could prove that they were not used anymore. That's right. So there's no reason why we could not do the same thing. We could do a more sophisticated analysis. Our current analysis only does reachability, like garbage collection reachability, but of course doing it statically on the points too. So it's quite imprecise. It's quite conservative. So for example, if you had a global variable pointing to a pool, we would, unless we did additional analysis, we would never know if that pool became dead or not. One important thing here, which I said before, is that the checks performed by the type checker are, are local to fun individual functions. <clears throat> and one interesting point I want to make here is that this strategy of performing the safety checks ahead of time and then doing 
the type checking in a bytecode verifier can be used for any security properties that can be encoded as type systems. And so, for example, it can, so David Walker had a, had a very nice paper at, in Popple 2000 showing how security automata, which are a class of security problems defined by Fred Schneider at Cornell, he showed that security automata could be represented as, as types. And Andy Myers had, uh, has, has done extensive work on encoding information flow properties in type systems. And you could do those kinds of security properties in the same framework and in a robust way. Yeah? So does, does that apply just to the, uh, the homogeneous okay. pools? No. Well, okay, so that's a good question. So if you needed um, type information for individual objects in other pools, then it would apply only to the homogeneous pools. If you needed type information um, only for entire collections of objects, like like the entire the set of objects in a points to node, then that restriction wouldn't occur. And in fact, I think to take some of these type systems and figure out how to use them in on top of SVA um, is a research problem if you want to do it for arbitrary C code that's not type safe and hard to analyze. If you were running type safe code on top of this environment, you might not have this problem at all. And so um, you could effectively, you, would, you, could, uh, you could engineer, uh, design a system so you only had type homogeneous pools in those cases. <coughs> okay, so I was gonna talk briefly about a couple of future security applications of SVA, but I'm running over time here, so I think I will skip that, and I'll just leave you with the key insight here, which is that in this in this system, and this is the same slide from before, with just one additional comment, which is that this system gives us a compiler and a privileged runtime that underlies all of the code that's executing on uh, executing on this system, and. Putting those two, th two things together, you can, you can try to do, you can take novel attacks on existing security problems that, um, that already exist and, and, and there's research going on on them. Um, we're looking at three different problems here, uh, minimizing privilege for programs that run today as SETUID root, protecting application data from the OS, so preserving secrecy of application data, monitoring kernel mode rootkits, and there's a number of other ones that we're interested in, in addressing too over the long term. And um, if anyone's interested in, in anything in more specific details about this, I'd be happy to, to talk about that with you. So just a quick summary here, and I don't know why this boxes are going grayed out, but um, I've talked about secure virtual architecture, which is a framework to provide a safe execution environment for system software, and in fact, potentially all of the applications and software that run on a system, it provides a safe environment for programs that's fully automatic. It provides a safe environment for the entire OS that requires some porting effort, but the porting effort is relatively small for an OS project. And it enables higher level security capabilities, which I think are a wide open research area, and if anyone is interested in specific security problems that you'd like to explore, I'd be very interested in in uh, collaborations if you are. And it's the safe execution environment solves the first class of problems that I had described in the, in the three categories that I described earlier and opens up a whole number of other problems that we can do research on. So let me stop there and, and take any more questions if you have any, or if you want me to talk about in more detail about any part of what we did, I'd be happy to do that also. So we have time for two or three questions. Um, so, so, so you okay. compared you compared with uh, like uh, Spin and Kafka OS, Java OS, and Singularity in the beginning. Right. Um, a feature of those systems is that they allow arbitrary code to be loaded into the system, and then then, the, then there's a decision procedure: will we accept it or will we not? Right. Whereas in this environment, you there may be some porting effort involved, uh, and you I think you are assuming like cooperative uh, programs. So you you are you're increasing this, the safety of um, 
the male demons, and it's like sent male and HDBD, you know, these yeah. things. Um, but is this really suited for, for this uh, environment where you have adversarial programs that, that can be... So I'm not sure why you're saying... Um, well, e e either the those systems can check ahead of time that, that software is safe. They cannot do that because many in many cases they will do runtime checks to guarantee safety properties. And bounds violations are a, are a simple example of that. Java does a number of runtime checks for safety, including array bounds violations, null pointer dereferences, and so on. Right. So they sometimes discover runtime violations just like we do. The second part that um, I don't think is quite accurate is we can run adversarial code in the kernel too because we can detect ahead of time if there is any code that we are not able to analyze. So in particular, when we guarantee that, so when we take a program and, and transform it with safe code and guarantee that it's memory safe and type safe, partially type safe and so on, that is a strong guarantee. The program cannot violate that guarantee. The guarantee itself is somewhat weaker than what a, than what a safe language would give you because of dangling pointers. But the program cannot manipulate or corrupt external data um, that was not permitted by the surrounding environment through some API. So but what if you try to load a binary module? Yeah, uh, we don't support binary modules. In fact, uh, true. Uh, in fact I, I was just referring to the fact that Linux kernel allows you to load modules. So right. That, so you can have to have some mechanism for detecting that because yeah. the underlying architecture, I mean, you're using x86 and you're still using x86, so the, if you did sort of pick up that binary module, it would sort of run. Well, so, oh. so Linux allows you, and, and other operating systems allow you to dynamically load kernel extensions, right? And in fact, Linux, many things are kernel extensions, including file systems, um, the, the network, parts of the network stack, of, um, device drivers, but this is why I was saying that it's important that this is a local. These these steps are local operations. We can perform these steps on the dynamically loaded module separately from the rest of the kernel, right? and so we can do this verification and do dynamic loading of modules without any problem. We cannot do that with native code. This is not native code. It, the modules have to be compiled to SVA bytecode. If the kernel extension interacts with, the, for example, the kernel having some kind of, like, for example, passing pointers or stuff like that, you said in that case you just uh, disable those uh, checks because you cannot get a get, um, very precise thing. So. so, okay, so there's two ways in which you could run, kernel, you could compile kernel extensions ahead of time. and. One of those would have that problem and, and another way would not. The right way to do it is that the kernel extension itself is compiled along with the rest of the kernel. It's distributed separately, it's loaded separately, right? And you can have multiple versions of, of, this, of a particular kernel. So for example, you could have multiple file systems or different implementations of the TCP stack and so on, right? But as long as you compile the extension together with the rest of the kernel, then we don't have any of those limitations. We can do checking for all of those objects. But I, what I was referring to at that point was pointers coming in from external code like user space programs, like a buffer coming in to printf or something else. Right? Those objects are completely outside the kernel itself, including extensions or anything else. Yeah. Uh, so actually, it sounds like you might want to do the other thing though, where an extension is, is uh, separate from the kernel itself in the sense that it doesn't share pools and can't corrupt um, just for isolation. Yes. Um, is, is there some support for that? You could do that. I think it won't happen fully automatically right now because either because of the way the extension works or because of imprecision in the point analysis, we might uh, infer a particular points to graph node that contains objects both from the extension and outside the kernel and from the rest of the kernel, right? Um, I think the point analysis imprecision is the important one there. If the goal is that the extension should not share any data with the kernel, then the first problem doesn't occur. But the point analysis imprecision can occur. 
one way to deal with that is the programmers programmers can modify the code to try to eliminate the reasons for that imprecision and these are this is something that you can provide very descriptive compile time feedback on which which variables are getting merged with pointers uh, into pools that that appear to uh, come in from the outside and simply by for example uh, not storing pointers in some uh, in some in one data structure but putting it in a different data structure or reorganizing the data in a different way so incoming pointers and internal pointers don't ever merge you could get around that so I think there would be additional porting effort if you want to isolate an extension completely in the sense that it doesn't even have a common pool with the rest of the kernel. Right? We do guarantee now that the extension cannot actually corrupt any data that are not in the pools that it's accessing. And even in the pools that it's accessing, it cannot do any bounds violations. So it can only access objects that its code that was described directly in the code. Okay. <coughs> yes. What about the information flow within different objects, uh, between objects of the same pool, thinking that uh, so my, my social security number and your social security number will be the same object? Yeah, that's something that we just, this is just not precise enough to, to analyze. So, for, so if you wanted to be able to track, to isolate objects that we end up mapping into the same pool, you wouldn't get that isolation. Right? But one thing to keep in mind is if you're doing any kind of compiler-based technique to enforce that isolation, you have to do some pointer analysis or some, some such static analysis to disambiguate those objects. Right? And if you can do that, then in fact we can make our thing more precise. So, because uh, it seems that if this system chose not to change the APIs, do you so really want to minimize the porting effort? Yeah. And the, the problem that... Uh, so I wonder whether it requires uh, act, uh, that we change the API so that the, these policies... Uh, yeah. be well, I think, you know, I think for, that, for the second class of security applications that I was talking about there, that... For many of them, including information flow, uh, denial of service, uh, certain kinds of denial of service problems, application data secrecy, you, you have, it's a research problem to figure out what is the right support that's needed. You, you will need some combination of new APIs, potentially some programmer intervention. Uh, actually, if you have new APIs, then certainly some programmer intervention, um, additional, possibly additional compiler techniques, extension, type system extensions, and so on. It, those things are much, much more sophisticated, high-level security issues, and you know they don't come for free by any means in any of these systems. Okay, with that, um, I'd hey. like to thank our speaker. Thank you.